So welcome to House of Capra. My name is Aidonta. Um, I'm your host for today. We're going to talk to Professor um, or Dr. William Henry for two hours. So we start at eight. That's now we started at eight and we finish at 10. Um, there are four sections to every, um, for every uh, topic. We have, we, we have four sections and after, after every section, we will come to our, our Facebook page and see your questions. So it's really important uh, that you, um, you know, uh, drop your questions as well. So this is very interactive. We talk, we have our questions, but we also make sure that you are being heard. So if you have any question, drop them in the, um, in the Facebook, in the comments, of course. If, you're not, if you don't have a Facebook page, you're not, um, I don't think you can, um, uh, I don't think you can put questions in. So it's only if you have a Facebook page. Um, what else, what else, what else? Now, Professor William Henry, Dr. Henry, um, Dr. Les, as we say, is also um, a, a DJ and um, um, how do you say it? When you do martial art, a martial artist, I don't know how you say that, but yeah, I think- that's fine, I'm a DJ, but remember chat lyrics, not play, although I do play records with my brethren, Kenny Monroe, so I'm a DJ in both senses. A I DJ. Music, but I also chat lyrics. Chat, yeah, 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 yeah. And you show them. Serious. You know, I wanted to ask you if you could send me some uh, of your clips so I can share them to people because this is, uh, you shared some and I really enjoyed those, really enjoyed those. Um, well, they can always go on my professor, William Les Henry YouTube, YouTube channel. YouTube channel, then you can yeah, see. Yeah, because there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff there. Okay, so you heard you can uh, visit uh, the Doctor Professor William Les or DJ Les Henry. Oh, Professor William Les Henry, maybe you Professor want to William Les Henry YouTube channel. Then you can yeah. see more of his skills. So uh, this is uh, Don. Welcome back. Don went on a on a holiday and is back a few days and he still joined us. From like, where? Uh, where did you go, brother Don? Well, I just, I, I, was, I was chasing black Madonnas all across Southern <laughs> Europe. Over we, where? We are, we are, we are, we, Southern Europe, Italy okay. and France to Switzerland. We had, a, we had a session with Sister Benji explaining to us about black Madonna and how she went widening and all over across Europe. So. I was gathering much more proof, you know, to to keep on working on that matter. So I was oh, chasing okay. Black Madonnas all across Europe, all the villages. It was quite interesting. Absolutely, I can imagine. I can imagine, yeah. Uh, that sounds so, like a great yeah. piece of work. I'm Sister back. Benji, what are you Look tired. <laughs> yeah, Sister Benji has been working all day. Thank you for joining us. Sister Benji is also uh, a historian and a, a, a school teacher, and she's been teaching all day, rushed home so she can join this session. Um, yeah, we're gonna start with a, a, a recap, a short recap from, from uh, Don. What have we been doing up till now to give you all an idea? Yes. Now, it's a blessing and an honor to have you on the show tonight, Professor Dr. William Henry DJ Les, or we uh, may not know your DJ name uh, already. Leslie Lyric. Uh, Le uh, Leslie Lyric, DJ Leslie Lyric as well, <laughs> most talented, and a scholar. Uh, we've been actually like almost for the past eight weeks, actually uh, busy. We started on a Wednesday evening and then we went back on the, we started on Monday, we went on a Wednesday evening, then we get back on the Monday evening. We had um, Professor James Smalls as one of the first to okay. introduce to us, to introduce us to African spirituality. Yeah. Then we went, then we had a session with Professor Kaba, who uh, went deep in on um, African spirituality and who actually met us with the combination between the Western African Orishas and the uh, Egyptian deities, Egyptian, yeah. ancient Kemet deities, and uh, several practice about uh, African sacred science, AKA spirituality. 
and from then we uh, we had uh, hold on a second, Professor James Puskaba. Then we had um, I. Can you support me on that one? I'm, I'm for, oh, Sister Benji, I'm with, uh, Sister Benji, but you already mentioned it. Sister so Benji, yeah, okay. Sister Benji. We, yeah, and we then did, we had uh, a session on Black Madonna, and also a little historical uh, context about the malls into Europe. Mm -hmm. From Sister Benji, we had a session with me about uh, the Congo spirituality uh, specific and also the similarity from the Congo spirituality and the African circumstances in general, including Vinti, what they call the Surinam Vinti and Voodooism. Yeah. Uh, then we had Brother Paul Abina uh, and, and the, the, the timeline lineage and his wonderful work he did on most like 10,000 history on the flipboard. And we had uh, Dr. Chantel Sherman, who also be yeah. part of the show for at least two times, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, twice. We had her twice uh, on two Mondays, and which she was explaining to us the pop culture. And um, I could have said pop culture as at least what I could understand from that how pop culture was used into white supremacy to as a political force against blacks yeah. right across uh, the world. And tonight we're having you uh, to go further in about the whiteness uh, and, and the, some of the, the work you did and about your books so that you could enlighten, enlighten us much more about uh, this matter. That's Thank you. That's some uh, of the aspect we'll be discussing the past seven, eight weeks actually is tonight. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, almost three months. So I have to say, Kemet Journey, welcome. He joining. He says, Imhotep, my brothers and sisters' journey is follow the conversation. Thank you. And wow. Amal is also joining us. Hi. We're waiting for the others to join us, but we will start now. Um, I read your book, well, half of it. I read the book, half of it. And I have to say, um, what really struck me is that the way you talk to us with reasoning, when I hear the word reasoning, I think of, uh, of Dr. Les, because you are the one who introduced reasoning and not just the word reasoning, but what it meant. And we're gonna, um, I want to, because of reasoning, I think, is the tool to, to deal with this whole um, racism, white supremacy, uh, whiteness. Um, first, I want to say um, thank you for the book. Thank you for the book. Um, it's, it's a good read, and it's like talking to you. It's like talking to you. Oh, well, I'll we'll give thanks. <laughs> Thank you. No, really, it's like talking to you, and you gave so much examples. So it's um, it's it's all in here. If you want to understand whiteness, it's all in here. And you start your book with uh, a quote from uh, His Imperial Majesty. I, I hope yeah. I said it, Haile Selassie. Why why did you do that? Well, one of the reasons you've actually hit the nail on the head, because I learned to reason from Rastafara. So it's you know, I'm of Jamaican parentage, was born in England. And one of my earliest teachers who calls himself Elder Herakuti now, we knew him as Ras Cosmo Ben Imhote, and I met him when I was 11. So we're talking, how old am I now? 52 years I've known this brother. And he taught, probably more than anyone else, taught us how to reason because with Rastafara, it's about overstanding. Because, you know, Rastas will tell you we've been under the stand for too long. So therefore, if you overstand something, you, it's almost as if you've got the full picture. If you stand over, if you've got a jigsaw puzzle and you look at it at this angle, you will only see that something looks flat. But if you stand over it, you can see all the pieces and perhaps work out how they will fit together. And that's what Rastafari is. So for me, it was important to, in, to introduce, you know, his Imperial Majesty, Emperor Ali Selassie I, into the reasoning. Because whilst, and I admittedly do not know whether I am Rastafari or not, 
Rastafari was my foremost teacher. Rastafari and reggae music made me know that I'm an African person and I've never moved away from that. So that's why it was important. I'm glad you picked up on that because it was important for me to have his majesty. And the quote is about him basically saying that we must tell our own histories. If you want to collapse it into, you know, a sentence, it echoes what Chinu Achebe, one of my favorite so-called Nigerian authors said, he was Igbo. And he basically said, if as African peoples, we don't tell our own stories, we will disappear. He didn't say we might disappear. He said, we will disappear. And nowadays, and as we go into the conversation, there's much talk about moral courage. And one of the things that his majesty had was moral courage. That's why Bob Marley's war tune is his speech to the United Nations. You know, depending on who you talk to, some people will say he was this, some people will say he was that, but he had moral courage. Although according to Garvey, perhaps he didn't, but that's another conversation for another time. But for me, he had that moral courage to actually say these things in the public arena. This is this. And I saw it go. And to me, that's what we have to do. We have to be able to stand up, say what we've got to say, and reason. Because yeah. you will find that most of the people who are extremely anti-African, and we can, I know in one of the sections I will develop this, they are unreasonable in the sense that they have, you know, one idea of this is what constitutes knowledge. These are the only sources that can be the foundations for that knowledge. And that is what they say knowledge is. But for us who are written out, excluded, you know, the brother said he went across Southern Europe, us, brother um, Don? You said across Southern Europe? Yeah? Yeah, sorry, I should have to unmute the microphone. That's cool, yeah. but you didn't say Southern Africa. You said Southern Europe. So a lot of people Southern are Europe, that yeah, this... why Southern Europe and not Southern Africa? And the reason is because we have been written out of history and it's deliberate. It's a deliberate erasure. So that's one of the reasons why I also got a quote from Minister Farrakhan right at the beginning of the book. And I do that because, you know, I am not afraid to use the knowledge that I believe has brought me to this place in this time, at this point. I'm not afraid of that because I have said it for years and I say, like, you know, I give thanks for the Times House of Kepra you invited me to to Netherlands, went to Kemet with you all. And one of the things where I always say, I believe I'm a vessel for African liberation. It's not Les, it's, I am a vessel. I believe my ancestors, the God, the goddess, creator, whatever we want to reference, absolutely selected me as a vessel for our liberation. In the first instance, as Africans, in the second instance, as human beings. Wow. So that's the premise that I work from in what I do. Thank you for that. Beautiful. Beautiful, yeah, beautiful. Yeah. This is, I think this is the only way, um, this, this is the way to do it. Thank you for your work. And um, we only have two hours, but what I really actually want to say as well before we go ahead is that when I was doing the, the promotion, of course I had to uh, visit um, His Imperial Majesty, I hope I said, um, his uh, speech. And um, there is a Rastafarian who's quoting and say, please call him by his name, the first, I'm sorry. Because this is also part of whiteness, of course, when there is no, absolutely no honor to our people. When it's our people, it's like without, you know, the titles. It's yeah. only, always without. So you can see whiteness all around you. You can even see it in your app. The heroes are white. You cannot change the colors of your heroes. So I just wanted to, to say that if you want to see it, you'll see it. Um, yeah, okay. sure. Thank you. Our first question, and then um, uh, Sister Benji and, and, and Don are going to take over, is uh, what is racism? How do we recognize it and where is it from? So the basis, so people, so we will, you know, hit it off from the same spot. Yeah, so right, for me, because of, 
because of time constraints, I believe that if we're talking about racism as we know it now, which is systematic, therefore it's systemic, it's institutionalized, and it colonizes the consciousness of everyone in the Western world comfortably. Now, racism for me is a system that may be in this sense, 500 years old. And when I say it was 500 years old, I am not saying there wasn't things that we could look at historically and say that was racist. What I'm talking about is a system that created a hierarchy that comfortably located white Western, generally men, but white women, as we will discuss as we go through, can invest in that to a point. But a system was created that, that, that was based on a hierarchy that white was the apex. This is the best you can be. And black was the lowest you can be. Now, a lot of people will say, you know, we shouldn't call ourselves black, we should call ourselves Africans, we should this, that. Again, we can discuss this as we go on. But for me, if you want to understand the system of racism, you have to look at how it basically deconstructed and reconstructed knowledge based on a hierarchy of white at the top, top, black at the bottom. So if we look at, let's say if we look at European history, Okay, let's just say we're looking at it. Bearing in mind that Napoleon said, history is a set of lies agreed upon. That's one of the things what Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte said. So let's work from that premise. Okay. Now what we have is we've had a set of lies that have been agreed for millennia by Europeans. In the first instance, they created the system called racism. So a good way to, to appreciate that is when Walter Rodney says many people mistakenly believe that chattel enslavement of Africans was based on race. In the first instance it wasn't based on race it was stone cold economics and then once they had to justify that system especially to let's say the poorer disenfranchised Karl Marx lumpen proletariats wherever they are in the Western world, they had to create another way to, to, for people to perceive African people. So all the knowledges that they knew they got from Africa, like Europeans knew, Isaac Newton, you know, he talked to anybody who studies Isaac Newton. And I only know this because one day I bought this book called Gravitation and Cosmology. Don't ask me why I bought it because I couldn't understand any of it. As I say the works, I'm flicking through it, and in that book it says, Isaac Newton based much of his theories on ancient Egyptian knowledges. And with a lot of people like that, once it became revealed that the ancient Egyptians were African, and remember Napoleon is the one who really put that into the Western world with his expeditions there, a lot of them started to denounce African knowledges and they racialized it. So what they would either do is whitewash it or deny it. Right. Because oftentimes it's very difficult to get away from the foundation of something just by denying it. You have to whitewash it. So for instance, you know, we've been to Kemet. I believe it's either Edfu or Dendera. I can't remember which temple it is, but the one that's got the Hippocratic Oath on it like two, 3,000 years before Hippocrates. How is this possible? Because it was Imhotep's oath. Or how is it that the pyramids, which many people don't really understand, are four sides. So it's not three sides, they're four sides. So actually they're in a square, but it's also a circle. Because to make a perfect circle, you have to use a square. And to make a perfect square, use a circle. Again, I'm not no person in geometry and all that, but I'm not a fool. But the fact is, the pyramids were constructed on Pythagoras' theorem, thousands of years before Pythagoras. How do you explain this? The way you explain it is you will say to people, yes, well, you know, the Africans did have some kind of knowledge in Egypt, but they were dark-skinned Caucasians. These are one of the things that you can find. 
in yeah, books where they've actually said the ancient Egyptians, yes, they were black in complexion, but really they were dark skinned Caucasians. Yeah, or aliens, right? Or aliens. That's what Brother Hakim always says. Rather than say it was some Africans, you say it's little green men, rather than little black ones or little black men and women. Yeah, yeah. It has to be little green men. Yeah. So for me, when we talk about the system of racism, it's deliberate. And the people who set it up knew in perpetuity it would impact us. Well, no, they knew it would impact generations of Africans because it would get Africans, one, hating themselves. Because if you actually believe you've contributed nothing to the storehouse of human knowledge, of course you will hate yourself. And if somebody says to you, you're worthless and you're the first one to do this or the first one to do that, you're going to believe it because without that knowledge of self, how are you going to know? That's what racism does. Racism privileges in some senses and it excludes in others. And that's why it's systemic, it's institutionalized. And as we go through the conversation, we can Yeah, yeah, develop that. Into it. exactly. And um, because all this, because your book has um, eight chapters and I would say that every chapter goes into a uh, some of the the pieces as we go through and in, in the racism right yeah. yeah yeah and um what i because now you have structured it and you have said okay this is what racism is and this is how it's being kept this is why it's institu institutionalized how do we address it because oftentimes we get into situations and then we'll be like hmm we know it's racism because we can feel we have this, you know, yeah. sense, of course, right? Yeah. Uh, like you said in your book, uh, uh, the, the, the first, um, um, I would say, um, I'm a four belt example you give uh, in your work, right? That you know that it was a racist act, right? So yeah. you can feel that it's racist. And most of the time we don't address it. But I think now is the time that we address it. So how do we train ourselves to address it? And then we go to the next chapter. Yeah. Well, for me, I think the first thing you do is you try and accrue a knowledge of self. And it sounds simplistic, but there are certain things you can do. So one of the things that really bothered me as a child was that and so I, I think this probably was from primary school. So before I was 11, I always used to think, how come there's no black people done anything? The only black person who did anything positive was Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali, heavyweight champion of the world. So that was an exemplar of what being black was as a success. Malcolm X was the devil. So we had that kind of juxtaposition. But as, a, as, as I said, as a child at school, you know, it used to bother me because I knew I was one of the cleverest people in the class, along with my twin brother. That was, that was just straight. We knew this. So I always used to think, well, I can't be the first clever black person. My siblings who came from Jamaica were like geniuses. So how is it that they're not represented there if we're saying that, the, and then time I think they used to tell us that based on the biblical thing, I think they used to tell us the human beings were 6,000 years old or civilization or whatever. And again, a reference point that they take from Kimmet, which is why history goes backwards and then it comes forwards. So the people who don't really understand that. And for me, these are the things what you do, you sit down and you think about why is that? Why is, why is it that I am constantly being reminded the first black to do this or the first black to do that or the first black to break into this or the first black to break into that? When they tell us, even white racists have to admit, the first human beings were from the continent of Africa. So how can we be supposedly the mothers and fathers of every person on this planet and never contributed anything? Because to me, you know, and it's interesting that you mentioned the whiteness made simple book. So because I am what I am, in the whiteness made simple book, I've got a chapter called Too Black for Your Own Good. Yeah. That track was actually based on a lyric that I wrote, which is why 
I believe, I can't remember what verse I've got in the book, but if it serves me correctly in the book, because again, with the Whiteness Made Simple book, it's not a linear book. You can literally dip in and dip out wherever you like. It's not a linear book. And when I used to do book launches, I said that to people. If you feel like reading the last chapter, it will make sense because they're contained little reasonings as if I was reasoning with people. And in the two black for your own good, what happened was I went to America. First time I went to Jamaica in America was 1985. And I went to America and I was staying with a good friend of mine in Washington. And we went for dinner with some of her friends. And when I listened to how they were describing black people in Britain, I realized one, they thought we all lived in Brixton. Yeah. And two, they had no clue that a lot of what we were going through was exactly the same as what they were going through in the States. They didn't have a clue. So I wrote a lyric called Two Black in Brixton. And I played on the words Brixton and Britain. And that chapter that is in that book, I wrote it for a African American journal and it was rejected. And the reason it was rejected is because I refused to use Afrocentric and I used Afrocentric, as in African centric. I refused to use Afrocentric because I said, for me, Afro was a powerful aesthetic statement and I don't want to remove it from its context. Anyway, cut a long story short, editor refused to publish it. So what I did as I do with all my stuff, I put it in my book. Yeah. That's what I did. Uh, uh, Professor Les, could you explain to the to, 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 to the viewers the difference between Afrocentric and right? So for me, my major critique of Afrocentric or Afrocentricism. Yes, and we're talking at the time when when the book came out. I think Maleficati Asante's book came out about eighty nine or something like. That. I can't remember. But when I read the book, we are invisible in that book unless I misread it. When I say we, I'm talking about from the Caribbean, many from the parts of the continent, and definitely from Europe, because that's what we are, whether we like it or not. Yeah. That's what we are. We are Africans from Europe. In Europe. I am not an African British. I am, I am, African. But I am an African in Europe. When I looked at Afrocentricity, one of my major critiques was it was very African American centered, as is much of the dominant narratives that seeks to explain us. Think about what's happened with the killing of our brother George Floyd. If you watch the news items, I can't say if it was the same where you are in the Netherlands, but what I can tell you absolutely in the UK, it would be protesters in England are outraged at um, Black Lives Matters, whatever happened to George Floyd in America. So it's America, 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 America. All the, all the shows, America, 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 America. Forgetting that we get the George Floyd stuff here all the time. It just wasn't on film in that way. Although some of it was because they've been killing brothers and sisters over here for, for years, for decades. <laughs> But it's often hidden. So to me, I remember reasoning with, um, and I know myself and sis, I have definitely had this conversation, why a lot of Pan-Africanists don't like me. A lot of Garveyites don't like me. North Rasta don't like me. But I don't really care. Oh. Because to me, it's about reasoning. So mm -hmm. when I used to say to people, I really did like aspects of Afrocentricity, but it bothers me that we're invisible. So it's like oh, Afrocentrism is just Caribbean. like concentrated on, on, on an American, American. African Americans uh, are the center of that world and that yeah. universe. And Afrocentricity like, is like say it. all of us. Yeah. Uh -huh. And it was in 1994 when I met Professor Paul Gilroy, who I've done one of my outer views with. And I remember when I met Professor Paul Gilroy, because I'd heard all this stuff about him. He's a traitor. Him is a sellout, blah, 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 blah. When I met him in 1994, and I was mm -hmm. reasoning with him. And I said to him, what do you think about this book? And he said, yeah, yeah, it's a good book. It makes some good insights. But as usual, it's very American centered. As if African-Americans 
are the center of the universe. If you want to look at the best of Africans, where do they send you to? America. If you want to look at the worst that Africans can be, where do they send you to? America. Because it becomes almost like, if you say African-American, it's almost like a euphemism for all African sufferation across the planet. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that isn't a good thing. What I'm saying is it needs to be developed. What about the Dutch speaking Caribbean? What about the Spanish speaking Caribbean? What about the Portuguese speaking Caribbean? What about all the other places in the diaspora, like your brothers and sisters from Suriname and Cape mm -hmm. Verde and all these places in Netherlands? If I hadn't been going, I wouldn't really know that much. I would only know, yeah, in Ireland, them have some Surinamese people, you know, and them say Ras. That's all I would know. <laughs> How would I know anything yeah. else? So to me, one of the things what I think is incumbent upon us all is to stand up and critique these things. Because to me, if you're an academic or a scholar and you can't take critique, get another job or just keep reinforcing the whiteness that comes out the ivory tower. I refuse to do that. And that comes from, you know, my DJ life. And what I was saying about the two black in Brickstein is I'll do a verse for you, which encapsulates my take on racism. So the second verse went, many people have labeled me a racist because I express my feelings in front of your faces. You ask me what it's like to be born and raised in this country. First thing I tell you, wife, I say ain't easy. One of my first memories as a kid was the kind of statement that left me lidded, like adult whites so who you think would know better, living out the colonial mind to the letter. Keep teaching their <laughs> kid and kin that anything with a black skin was a product of sin. Nothing better than a two-legged mule, the Hollywood fool only fit for ridicule at school. These kids would ask me questions like these. Hear what I'm asking me now? Have I got a tail? Do I swing in trees? Is my head full of lice? Am I riddled with disease? My dad said, you're a dog. Do you harbor fleas? My fists would answer questions like these. But as I matured and got to realize these were the savages, I was civilized. How could they tell me that I was ignorant and call me a monkey's uncle as a serious statement? We've caused some abatement to this way of thinking from the fountain of blackness, the whole world is drinking. Look at our music, our style, our culture, embraced by the youth the whole world over. So never complain or show any shame if anybody ever tells you you're too black in Brickstain. That's one verse from that. That's a real boss. <laughs> and I wrote that in, I started yeah. to write that track in 1985 in Washington. Well, prior to public enemy though. So. Well, you see, and this is, this is the thing, you know, when I say to people, you know, like a lot of people say to me, oh, you know, you, you're a university, you're a professor, you're this, you're that. I say to them, if you look at 90% of what I write, I begin it with a lyrical extract. I've been thinking about this since a, a very long time. But to me, what we need to do is, which I know House of Kepra and all of you do, especially Sister Benji, when we did the wonderful tour around Amsterdam, mm -hmm. and she's showing us all these, you know, black stuff that we never would have seen around the symbolism. To me, what we have to do sometimes is find ones who have an overstanding. You don't have to agree with them, mm -hmm. but you can have the reasoning. Yeah, for real. And then you will realize that, look, if all four of us were walking down the street in Peckham in London, the police mm -hmm. are not going to say, oh, let's harass Prof Les because he's UK British. They're going to harass us all. <laughs> yeah. your accent, or if you start chopping some Dutch on them, they're going to be like, oh, this is probably a foreign citizen. Better leave these ones alone. Mm. Or, or they say we this. Are absolutely interchangeable. They, they will say these are some foreigners. Let's, ex, let's, let's all export them back to wherever they came from. Yeah, that, could, so okay. that would be the dominant yeah. narrative now. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But my point is. You know, just like when I've been in 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 um, Amsterdam or Rotterdam, and people have started chatting Surinamese to me, of course. and I'm like, yeah, fine. Yeah. Because how do you know? This is one of the biggest tricks that white people have pl played on us as Africans through this whole whitewashing of everything. Mm -hmm. They've made many of us deny the fact that. Africa. The Africans and it yeah. is not homogenous. Right, right. And it's it's
even it's even on a higher level because um, I, I like to I like this this statement that I've read that they say um, if you're Jamaican or Dominican or whatever the only thing that changes is where the boat stopped you know Absolutely. that's the only thing Absolutely. and yeah. and um, you know it's and and it's so that even in Africa people are divided. Uh, be, uh, to uh, how should I say it by uh, community lines well, on your borders yeah, oh, yeah in um, borders. you know they, they would say like yeah I'm Igbo or Juruba or whatever you know it, sometimes it's more important to say that than to say that you're African you know because you're Juruba or mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're Ashanti or whatever you but know, remember, and, one of the, sorry to cut you, but remember, there's a rationale behind that. Of course. Because of there course. was an imposition of an African identity. Mm -hmm. This is what these people were. And I say all the time, if you studied anthropology, they will tell you why we didn't have mass wars on the continent. And I'm not into no romanticized Africans didn't kill Africans. Foolishness. Yes. Human beings can be quite messed up. So okay. human beings oftentimes like to just kill people over generally over women or land, because they're the two precious resources that most wars were waged over, okay? But they didn't have an African identity. And again, the way, as a, as a pan-continental identity. Right. But the imposition of those barriers by the Europeans from the Berlin Conference has exacerbated the tensions between those groups. Absolutely. So groups yeah. who would never live together were forced together. Yeah, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I have to break in. You're saying the Berlin Conference. We know what the Berlin Conference is, but could one of you please tell us something more about the conference so we can put it into context? What is the Berlin Conference? 18, 18, uh, 1884, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, the, the, the European uh, countries came together to uh, divide Africa and uh, to, yeah, to seize big portions of land. That's right. And, and what I actually found out, what really shocked me is that uh, we had this guy in Suriname called, um, uh, um, what's this called again? Kwasi, Kwasi, this man called Kwasi. Mm -hmm. And Kwasi was the person that um, uh, he knew about this, this bitter, and this bitter, uh, it's still used to fight malaria. And before uh, that he uh, shared his knowledge with the Europeans, they were not, uh, they weren't able to uh, enter into the mainland of Africa. They would only be outside on the fringes on the coast. Yeah. On the, on the, yeah. yeah, and when, when he actually uh, shared the knowledge about this bitter, which is also in bitter lemon, you know. You can see if you if you're somewhere if you're in a club and you're drinking bitter lemon, uh, no, excuse me, tonic. And you know, there's the black light. You can see that it's given this uh, purple kind of color. Okay. That's the tonic. That's the tonic. That's the quasi bitter. It's called kinin, kinine or kinin. Okay. And um. I actually read that after that uh, he shared that knowledge with them, they were able to enter into the the yeah into the forest into the the center into of the Africa. Interland, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, so it really shocked me that I'm like, oh my God, he actually did because he had a very uh, bad reputation in Suriname. That guy, because he uh, you know people saw him like a sellout. You know, because he actually went to Holland. They they uh, took big parties. He got a lot of money. You can see uh, the pictures that they made from him. He was dressed up in all this gear and everything. And he actually was angry because he wanted more money from them. Mm -hmm. But uh, what is really important is that uh, at this big conference, uh, a lot of the countries, France, Germany, Portugal, uh, Spain, the Netherlands, of course, the Netherlands was, were in South Africa, fighting with the British over that piece of land, you know. Uh, so they all um, 
had big pieces of land and uh, just the day I was looking at this, uh, the, the part that was um, not taken by anyone was the Congo. And, you know, we got a brother from the Congo here. And uh, let Well, me... that's, that's, that's not, to Is my that... knowledge, okay, no, you... kind of different because what happened was yeah. um, the Berlin Conference, they carved the Africa like a cake. Yeah. The difference is a Western nation didn't get the Congo. King mm -hmm. Leopold got it, but yeah. it wasn't the Belgian Congo. It no, was, it was his private. Uh, it was his private property. It was his private property. Yeah. So yeah, if that's the point he was making, sorry yeah. to yeah, yeah. cut in. Yeah. 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 No, yeah. but because because the most of them, like I said, the most of the countries were more on the coastal areas, so the yeah. heart of yeah. Africa remained. Yeah. And he said, "Well, you know." This is good for me. If you if you guys are not busy with this, I will take it. Yeah. And that is exactly what he did. But you and know butchered, something butchered was it between 50 fifteen million. and twenty-five million of us in twenty-seven yeah. years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's you know, why the Belgians took it over. Yeah. Because the other Europeans were basically saying this is too much of a bad example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So actually yeah. what you're saying is that um, Africa was divided. Yeah, uh, I think it took about 10 years. I don't think it was one year. It slipped me at the moment, but it, it was a very long and... Con no, maybe it wasn't 10 years. A year. It was, it was a year, a year, something like a year. Was it like a year or something? Yeah, I think something I'm confused like with the Haitian Revolution because that was 10 years. Yeah, actually, yeah, it took almost like a year. At the end, then uh, Bismarck and uh, That's it. King of Belgium then get in, yeah. It was yeah. like almost a year the way. Yeah. But what they basically did, you know, Sister Benji has said, and you know, Brother Don has said is, they carved the Africa like a cake. And one of the things what I, you know, when I'm reasoning with brothers and sisters, especially from the continent, and I've been to quite, I've been blessed, I've been to quite a few places there. And especially when I'm over there and I, and you know, a lot of people will get upset by what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it because I just believe it's true. If we kind of had an understanding of what was done. So you imagine, let's say all of us are four children from a father like me, who had five children for four women by the age of 20. Yeah. Let's just say, okay. One mother is from, I don't know, one mother is Yoruba, one is Ga, and one is Ashanti, let's say, yeah? You're my three children. Mm -hmm. And I say to you on May the 17th, 1884, whatever it is, you go and visit your mother over there. You go and visit your mother that, and you go and visit mm -hmm. your mother there. And the day you go to visit your mother is the day the Europeans impose those barriers. How are you gonna get back? Mm -hmm. You're not. You're not. Now you think about it. Think about if you got maybe when you go to Suriname, because I know this happens to me when I go to Jamaica, not so much now, but when I first went there in 1985, they take one look at you, how you walk. Why English? Why go on? You don't have to open yeah. your mouth. We look different. We walk different. Yeah. Your color Can you imagine if you're one. that person? Imagine yeah. if you're that person, how are you going to feel? Mm. Let's say you're that person and you are Yoruba or whatever it is, and you're there with these Yoruba people in this place, mm -hmm. and you can't get back to Yoruba land or whatever yeah, yeah. you want to call it. Yeah. This, this is actually what happened to my family, my father's family, <laughs> who was divided to real into, live to three countries. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and, and it's so. You know, the, what I can't really deal with is the, the hypocrisy, to say it like that, you know? Because, uh, of course, we always, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, attention for things that happen. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, Adolf Hitler is such a bad person. And yeah. we're, talking, we're talking about Adolf Hitler in Holland, like, 365 days in a year and you know and even the the if you look at what's happened that you know people are saying yeah you know the germans they they're really sorry for what they did they're sorry for what they did in europe 
but you never will hear them talking about what they did in Namibia, for instance. Absolutely. Remember, you concentration never... camps were perfected. Yeah. Sorry to cut yeah. you, sis, but concentration camps were perfected in Namibia. And they in killed Namibia. over, I think yeah. it was about eight to 10 million Africans in yeah. Namibia, yeah, depending exactly. on whose count you go by. Yeah. But absolutely. Exactly. And this is, this is one of the things that, you know, it bothers me sometimes when I hear how astoundingly ignorant of those histories people are. Yeah. I remember oh. once I was in a seminar when I was an undergraduate student. So I returned to full-time studies in my 30s. I was about 35. And when I returned, because I got kicked out of school at 15, no qualifications, college 16. I think I might have spoken about it in the Whiteness book. If not, it's definitely in my next book I'm working on. But the fact is, I knew I wasn't stupid. I knew I was actually cleverer than a lot of my teachers. Okay. Because the fools made one of the biggest mistakes ever. They used to kick me out of the class and sent me to the library. And I love reading. So I used to... <laughs> and then when they let me back in the class, we used to just challenge them. Yes. So I would go and then just read the stuff. And one of the things what I, what I realized from early out is what they don't want us to embrace is being African in a plural sense, that it doesn't have to be this. One of my sister, you know, Dr. Makeda Graham, you know, wonderful sister, she wrote a book called African um, Social Work and African Centered World Views. And she's supposedly mixed race, dual heritage, whatever. But one of the things what that sister wrote in that book was she said for her to come to terms with herself, mm -hmm. she realized I'm a composite African. Right, right. Yeah. I'm an African of many parts. Yeah. yeah, beautiful. So you don't have to say, which is why I'm not into none of these DNA ancestry. That you see what I say in the whiteness book. My family tree is a hanging tree, and I don't really want to find a tree that they hung my ancestors from. Strange. And then we end up with these names. Yeah, man. I have no interest. Like, I have no interest in memorials. Mm -hmm. You know, in England they're talking about raising five, six million pounds to build a bloody statue or something that you know pigeons will go and shit on or or drunks will get drunk and piss on them or whatever yeah. it is. um and I, I build an educational institute I, I have to i have to because the time is flying and we have a lot to talk about first want to go to the the people who are watching on facebook cool pepper power is saying the cake of africa about the berlin conference paul emma joined us then hi paul and High Cool Pepper, of course. And Paul M is saying, 1884 GMT Washington Conference. And um, he's also saying the Berlin Conference and Kine, and the language and the national boundaries dominated the continent. And that's yeah. Cool Pepper power. Applauded you on your lyrics. Thank you, Cool Pepper. And Paul M said, tonic water. Oh boy, still got it, mate. Again, please. The old boy still has it. Yes, yeah. he still has it. He has uh, like, he applauded, he has uh, the three hands. And um, Amal is saying that she has uh, a son and a daughter and she wants to know where she can buy the book. I have some um, I have some copies, but if they want to buy the book, where do they go? Um, uh, the you know what, sis, I, because we're live, what would probably be best is if you got some orders, if people want it, and I'll ship them to you, because if you buy them through Amazon, you'll pay as much for postage as you do for the book. And you know, that's not why I do my stuff. So at the end of the day, if you said to me, right, brother Liz, I've got this, I'll ship them over. Okay. Or if I know someone who's coming over, I'll get them to bring them over. Okay, good. So you can uh, get them at uh, House of Capra. Okay, yeah, thank I can, you for I can that. Get them to you. Yes, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. It's really interesting. People are watching. We are still live. And of course, now we talked a little about the, the history and the context of how it's divided, where we're from, and what is important to, um, um, to, to get our power back or to, to beat uh, whiteness and racism as a whole. Yeah. Uh, we have the stereotypes, of course. Could you please just only because of to give people the reference that um Swarte Piet, Gully Walk, Blackface, it's all the same yeah. method. Could you please yeah. enlighten us about yeah. 
Well, I know the Schwartz of Pete thing, and I know Brother Mitchell and his wife do a lot of good works around that, as well as yourselves, I believe. But, and for people who don't, you know, know what that is, the Schwartz of Pete is blackface. It's like Black Pete or whatever it is. And the best person to really speak on this is Paul Abinna, because I know a lot of my enlightenment came from, from Brother Paul. But basically for me, when we look at, you know, whether it's Black Pete or Schwartz of Pete, I think sometimes if we look at it in its historical moment, when it took place, it had a different representation. And the reason why I say that, and I think it's important for us to appreciate that is because during that historical moment, there would not have been many people who looked like us around. So it was like a representation for me, it was like a representation of an exoticized other. So people would have been getting these tales as, you know, probably from about the 16th century coming up, you'd have got tales of Africans as black as coal. Then they became as black as synonymous with the devil. Then they became, um, no, not became, but then a lot of that was already mixed up with this notion of Africans being apes, being savages, being less than. So let's say somebody said, let's have a, let's, let's put on a play and we're going to have an African in it. That person would be blacked up because that was the representation. For me, what is, what is, what I think is qualitatively different and maybe we should appreciate is why a lot of these things aren't banal, but they are actually racist is because a lot of the people who endorse, whether it's Swartz of Pete or the gollywogs that used to be on jam jars and stuff like that in, in the UK, it was Robinson's Jam, I had a gollywog in it. So when we were children, they would call us gollywog, they would call us sambo, they would call us wogs and stuff like that. The difference to me is that right now in 21st century Netherlands, people know why they do that. And to me, part of the reason they do that is because they want to reinforce this idea in the public arena that Africans are less than white people. Black people are less than white people. Africans are less than Europeans. It's a bit like, oh yeah, we can dress them up and we can still educate them, but inherently they're evil because they're dark and they represent the unknown, they represent the untamable, they represent the uncivilized. So when we see, like I used to do talks years ago on minstrelsy and coons, and one of the things about minstrelsy, which was quite interesting, and I use this with my students now, I teach a course called um, Race, Race, Ethnicity and Gender in Popular Culture. I do it for my third year levels, um, last year degree students. And one of the things I introduced them to is this whole notion of, if you watch a black and white minstrel film, an old one, if they've got white lips, they're generally white people under there like Al Jolson. If they've got red lips, they're usually black people. Now, to my knowledge, and I could be wrong, but the first minstrels to, to, to become entertainers were actually the Irish. Oh. And the Irish were seen as the niggers of Europe up until probably 30 years ago. Yeah. yeah? I don't know what the Irish oh. communities are, where really? you are, but over here, there's, there's a book called, there's a, I thought it was there's the, a, the an article called. This. There's a guy called um, God. Is it Isaac is Ignatiev or something? His last name is definitely Ignatiev, but he's got a, a series of like. Let's call it an article, and it's called "How the Irish Became White." And this book basically traces how the Irish went from being the niggers of Europe to becoming white. Good way to think about it is if you've ever been to Boston, because the Boston had a heavily influenced Irish police force, which is why they call them paddy wagons, because Irish are paddies. So on the same level, the Irish became white. 
And this is what I always say to people. Look, in England, they have this thing called BAME, Black Asian Minority Ethnic. They collapse everybody into Black Asian Minority Ethnic. What they don't tell you is Minority Ethnic is white. These will be people from maybe the Netherlands or usually Poland or Ukraine or someplace like that. And they will say, yeah, we're all in the same boat. You know, they hate us because we're Polish and they hate us because we're this. But within a generation, they're not going to be Polish. They're going to be just like other white people in yeah. over here. They're going to look like them. They're going to talk like them. The only difference is it might be Thomas, T-H-O-M-A-S, as opposed to T-O-M-A-Z. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With some lovely name at the back. Right. Whereas for us, as Africans, we've never been afforded that privilege. Because as much as us try, Michael Jackson, exemplar of that, we ain't making it. No. <laughs> you know, there's all these, these contemporary discussions about, you know, the white Jewish woman in America who passed as an African-American. I don't know if you've seen that. It's been all over the papers. Yeah, there was recently. just another one again. But you know the thing that, that, for me, she doesn't have to do it. If she understood how the white world works, she wouldn't have to make that effort. She would just go in there as an expert anyway, because that's what white people love. White people love, white people love other white people telling us what it means to be African, what it, okay. what it means for us to be black. They don't want us to have our own voices. Mm. So to me, when I see those things, I won't even circulate them, because to me it's another distraction. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. They've always that. been the experts on us. So who cares? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a that's a really good short version about the stereotyping. I want to go to the family who's watching. Um, hi, Ashe Sioma. She says, "Hold up." Uh, Jerry Millison is on. He says, "Each one, teach one, blessings and power, family." Um, remember that we have uh, like a few minutes of a delay. So sometimes your comments come in and we don't know where the comments come from. So I'm sorry for that. But okay. I'm saying the language and, um, and the national boundaries dominated the continent. And um, who else is still here? Jose, Bronze is also online. Hi, Jose. And um, who else and what else is here? Everybody's still watching. Um, we're still on, we're going to I think this is the critical thinking phase, critical thinking yeah. phase. One last thing I want to say about what I was going to say before when I said people will probably get upset mm -hmm. is religion. I was reasoning with someone the other day and I'm not going to go into no religious thing today, but I think we need to be open and honest. And that's why I've got that picture of that white dude who told me he was Jesus in Young Street in Canada when I was going shopping with my niece in 1999 and you know sometimes you take a picture and you don't really know what you're going to do with it that picture became the front of the cover of that book because you know one of the things what i was reasoning with a bridge the other day and you know he's Ibo, and we were talking about you know africans murdering off each other left right and center in so-called nigeria because one of my mentors professor herbert Ekwe Ekwe, peace be upon him refused to call himself a Nigerian. He, he was Igbo, fine. And I said to the brother, you know, I haven't done the research, but maybe one of the people out there can do the research. I would like to know, what is the murder rate in Nigeria? And what would the murder rate be if you took religion out of the equation, Christianity and Islam? What would the murder rate be across the continent? Wow. And I think people are afraid to actually ask that question. But I would really like to know. Maybe one day if I've got time, I'm going to do some research around that. Mm -hmm. Because I think people yeah. would really be shocked mm -hmm. when they see how many of us, and I'm not saying to people, don't embrace Christianity. And I am not saying to people, don't embrace Islam. To me, if that's what brings you closer to the divine, in the sense that you will learn to love people who think differently and look differently, it's fine. But when it becomes this factional 
um, fanatical, I'll kill anybody who doesn't believe in what I believe in, or, you know, you say something about this one and we'll kill you and, you know, what, whatever. That for me is really problematic, but I would really like to know what those stats are. So if anyone's ever done any research into that, please let me know. Because I think that if that was made mainstream news, I'm pretty certain a lot of people would take a step back and think, what the hell is going on here? Because these, whether we like it or not, we're still worshiping alien gods. They're not Africans. Um, I would like you to, um, because you're, you're mentioning this because this has everything to do with whiteness. Because what happened here on this picture? Could you please? Yeah, go? right. So I'll tell you what happened. <laughs> I was in Canada, I was in Toronto, staying with like my family over there. And my niece who was 15 at the time, she's about 36 now, 37, something like that. It was my last day. So if you, if you see the image, I've only got 10,000 copies of the book here, and none of that. <laughs> let me get, hold on, let me get, get one. Right, so if people see the image, okay? So that's me. You'll notice in my, in my hand there's a shopping bag. See it? <laughs> And in my other hand is a leaflet. Okay. So it was my last day before I came back to England. And I said to my niece, right, I want to go and pick up my little bits, you know, from, you know, you go to wherever it is, the city centre. So we went down to Young Street. I'm sure it's called Young Street in Toronto. And when we were walking down Young Street, I saw a Jesus over that side and one over this side. <laughs> on the main road. Yeah. And they were like on a patrol. And you know what the roads are like in Canada. They're like America. They're long. Yeah. So I noticed the guy over the road first. And then we were when we were walking, this this dude here, this one, he said to me, fornicator. That's yeah. how he greeted me. And I know why he said that because, you know, Ras, I got locks. I had a young girl walking with me. Obviously he thought it was my daughter. I got no wedding ring on or anything. So he put two and two together and that's what he said. He said to me, fornicator. So I'm like, you know. He has some guts. But yeah. you know, I, I think it was a bit of that kind of shock and awe tactics. Because he probably knew I wouldn't have just, I wouldn't have even spoken to him. But anyway, so he said that. So I basically said to him, um, you know, how can you style me as that or whatever? And then he said to me, blah, blah, blah. And I said to him, listen, are you going to be here for about an hour? Because I'm going to go and do some shopping and I'll see you on the way back. So he said, yeah. <laughs> so what I did was I gave my niece my camera and I said to her, just go over there and take some pictures of Jesus and watch his demeanor change. <laughs> somewhere on one of my old drives, I've probably got about a dozen pictures of him. Yeah. Whoa. Because I said to her, just take pictures of Jesus and watch his demeanor change. <laughs> but the first thing I did, and you know, one of the things my mother always said to us, peace be upon her, is if someone greets you in peace, you accept them. If they yeah. show you something else, you deal with it accordingly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So if somebody offers you something, you take it. So when I saw him the second time, you know, he was a little bit more warmer in his greeting and he gave me his, his flyer, paraphernalia, whatever it was. So I'm looking at it and I've got my shopping bag. Yeah, so you'll see it. He gave me the flyer, so I'm looking at it. And I said to him, um, are you Jesus? And he didn't answer. <laughs> so I said to him, look, you know, I can see your leaflet and all that, and it's great, but are you Jesus? And he start quoting stuff and whatever. And I said to him, no, 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 no. I need to know, you know, 
are you Jesus? Bearing in mind, there's another one over the road. <laughs> yeah? And if you look at the image clearly, it's got a wheel on it. He wasn't even carrying the damn cross. He was wheeling it. It's got a wheel on. Have a look. Look at the bottom of the picture. As we, as we say in Jamaica, right, this, I lose half I am. And all the <laughs> respect I had for him, I lost. He didn't, he weren't even carrying it. He was wheeling this thing up and down the street. And I cut a long story short. I just kept saying to him, are you Jesus? And he wouldn't answer. So I said to him, you know what? Why are you dressed in a Roman toga? <laughs> because I said, if Jesus was someone who looked like you, I'm pretty certain he wouldn't dress in a Roman <laughs> toga. Right, exactly. Look at what he's got on. Yeah. He couldn't answer none of them. Listen, in the end, I actually thought he was going to put the cross down and attack me. <laughs> you know, I never wanted to go to jail for, could you imagine going to jail for slapping up Jesus? <laughs> I don't want to go to jail. Yeah. So I was just like, you know what? Be well, it's good. The man was hurling all kinds of hellfire after me as I was crossing the road <laughs> for my niece, or walking up the road to meet my niece. Yeah. But fundamentally, he couldn't answer the question. And one of the things that I said to him that he got really angry about was I said to him, I'm sure somewhere in that book it says, don't worship graven images, and you're one. Exactly. Okay, that's a very good story. Yeah. And, and you know something? This is what I was talking about when we start the conversation. What are the tools we, gonna, we, can, we can get to give answer to people when they put us on a spot? Um, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Jose Bronze is saying the whole south of Nigeria is Christian, not only Biafra and Igbo. Yeah, yeah. So that's true, Jose. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, my next question about the book is uh, the chapter um, Crouching Niggers and Hidden Crackers. Crackers. I, you know, I love the way you um, you named your uh, chapters because it already says the psychological. It, you know, directs into the psychological parts of yeah. what you have to deconstruct to understand whiteness. But yeah. this one really, could you please tell us more about this? Right, that's that is that is actually and 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 the and the end part is we're in a. White, white mess, Aya. Aya. So I was saying it like um, what Jamaicans would say. Boy, I'm in a mess, Aya. Like my life is messed up. You know, Aya is man. But it's also Messiah. White. Yeah, man. so that's why I played on the word Messiah. Yeah. And it's scratching niggas, yeah. hidden crackers. We're in a white mess, Aya. Exactly. Right. So we're under the white Messiah. Exactly. Whether we like it or not, you know, I remember... To kind of explain it, I used to have conversations with people and I used to say to them, what color is Jesus? And the African centered ones would say, um, or Pan-African ones or whatever, it's pro-black ones, they would say, you know, I know Jesus had just us in was African and blah, blah, blah. And I said to them, okay, before you came into that knowledge of self, what color was Jesus? And most of them wouldn't admit and I think the fact that they don't admit that is a problem because you're in denial. Mm. And I remember one day um, reasoning with my mum because like most of the people who, who came from that generation, Jesus was white. And he was real. And, and if we're being honest, and in our house, and it was, it was um, Werner Salman or whatever his name is, I'll talk about it in the book. It was his one with a purple heart that was spread by the US soldiers that colonized people's consciousness more than the Michelangelo ones that a lot of people say. It was the Warner Salman version or whatever it was. But anyway, and I remember one day I was reasoning with my mum and I said to her, I used to call my mum Muv, okay, which is like a cockney thing for mother. I remember one day I said to her, Muv, why is it that the only white fierce in this house is Jesus? There's no other white faces in our house. There were no pictures of any white people, only Jesus. And you know what my mom said to me? And that's why I loved her for her honesty. She said, 
from open my eyes a little bit near them tell me say Jesus that <coughs> they told her that was Jesus and it was only as she got older and she got into certain knowledges and one of my brothers gave her a book called the African Heritage Bible and the more she read the African Heritage Bible the more the white images of Jesus vanished from around the house until she ended up with one little one on her windowsill in her bedroom you know bless my mum but it's like she couldn't get rid of the last one yeah but in the latter days if you went to my mum's house there were no none of them big white jesus jesus is the head of this house they all vanished now the reason why i wrote i did the chapter in that way was in 2000 and it was about 2002 the bbc created the first ever black situation comedy you know like a sitcom them foolish comedy family comedy foolishness and it was called the crouches okay and it was supposed to be some kind of west indian family i don't think people really worked out where in the caribbean they came from but supposedly a caribbean family and what happened was it was one of the most disgusting and disparaging representations of us as African people in the diaspora I have ever seen. I think I watched two and I just would you would you that would you that stop the you just saw this kind of show like two weeks ago in the Netherlands. We pay license fee for the BBC. So anyway this program came on and I remember I had to, I, I couldn't watch it because I would have punched through the TV screen because I've punched the TV before, you know, and kicked it as well, yeah? And it can work out quite expensive. So I just, I think I watched two or three. And then what I did was I started to write what became that chapter. I was writing it as for a lecture because every year for Black History Month, October in the UK, I would do the lecture for like my local borough councils, Lewisham and Greenwich. So every year they would get me in to do like a big speech in one of the town halls. And for this year, I think it was 2003, it was Goldsmiths College where I was a lecturer in the sociology department. So I remember I was talking to um, Professor Les Back who, who you know, was my tutor got me through my PhD, my colleague, he's a mentor. He's like my brother, white guy, Professor Les Black. So when they invited me to do the lecture, I just gave them a title like something like, um, let's talk about race and representation. That's the title what I gave them, yeah? And then I wrote the little blurb saying, you know, in this talk, Dr. Les Henry will look at race and representation in popular culture, blah, 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 yeah? And you lot have seen how it works. So, you know, I always edit video clips together and put stuff like that. So we're talking 2002, yeah. 2003. Anyway, I've written out this lecture and one day when I was in my office, when I used to teach her, as I said at Goldsmiths, Les came into my office and I said to him, Les, what do you think of this title? Because that was like crouching niggas, hidden crackers. Because the film Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon had just come out. Yeah. And you know, I'm a martial artist and you know, I love Kung Fu films. Yeah. So I thought, let me play with that. And this Crouches, yeah, this TV program. So when I showed Les the title and I said to Les, um, what do you think about that title? And he goes, well, it's just you in it. You like to provoke people. So I said to him, okay. So what I did was when I went into the lecture, and this is no word of a lie, yeah. It was at the time the biggest lecture theater in Goldsmiths. So let's say it held 200 people. There was probably about 250 people in there. No, it wasn't, I lie. They, it wasn't in the biggest lecture theater, it was in probably the, one, of the, one of the other lecture theaters that should have held about maybe 150 people. There are about 200 people in there, sitting all up and down the aisles, like my students and others, wouldn't move for the security. And it was like, not the dean, but the person under the dean. So the second in command of Goldsmiths College, I remember it was a woman, can't remember her name. She was gonna introduce me. So she came out, you know, she did the introduction. And what I did was I made a short film 
And you know, I don't know if you know, um, it's a Curtis Mayfield track and it's, um, it's in it, it says, if there's a hell down below, we're all gonna go. Well, the track starts with niggers, crackers, whiteys, Jews. If there's a hell below, we're all gonna go. Yeah, I started with that. So what I did was I edited some film clips together and I played mm -hmm. that and I could see like the vice Dean or whatever it was, whatever she was, you could see she's white, her knuckles are going all red. She's like gripping the seat, yeah? And then it came up, crouching niggas, hidden crackers. Well, let me tell you something. You could hear a pin drop in there. But what I did was I broke it down. And what I basically said is sometimes, and this is what I tried to convey in the chapter, sometimes we get a representation of black that is the figment of someone else's imagination. What makes it more pernicious for me than when it was just written is the fact that these things are being sanctioned funded and disseminated to millions in the public arena through organs like the BBC. And with that particular Crouches program, apparently it was some famous author, I don't know his name, he'd written some famous programs for the BBC, like comedy shows. Apparently, because I, when I did the research, I looked into his biography and apparently he was on a bus going through New Cross, which is a part of South East London, Borough of Lewisham. And he saw all these black people milling around the station, New Cross Gate station. Mm. And there's a Caribbean food shop there. So he's put two and two together. And because it's right next to an underground station, he created these characters. And the father worked on the underground, I think it was, whatever, whatever. The first scene in Crouch, wow. The first scene in the Crouches, you had Roly Crouch, who was played by Rudolph Walker, very famous uh, black actor. Black actor. Yeah. Wow. He was hiding in a dustbin from a debt collector. Wow. Or hiding behind a dustbin. Wow. I mean, so well, how, how, how long ago was that show? 2002. And apparently they had one about a month ago called some Jamaican countdown that loads of people got up in arms about, again, funded by the BBC. And what I say to people is, there are a couple of things I'll say. One, no representation is better than misrepresentation in my mm -hmm. opinion. When it comes to us as Africans, you know, some people critiqued at the time with the Crouches and afterwards it came out that no matter how much the cast basically said, this is not accurate because it's these white directors and white producers, they just did whatever they want. But I'll tell you the worst thing about the Crouches that bothered me the most wasn't them the kind of foolish food they were eating saying it was Caribbean food. It wasn't that. <laughs> Even the that. worst thing about it, and, and I will ask you this, because one thing what I know, and I will say this on record, my mother always used to say, when it came to white people, the white people we were surrounded with, she always used to say, don't take up the dirty wears of these people, because them don't wash themselves. You know, they make them dog. I saw Ikea, is it Ikea or Ikea advert? Yeah. With the yeah. man bloody washing the, the, the baby and the dog in the sink. <laughs> so what? So the point, what, no, so the point I'm, I'm making is, this is, this oh. is the point, yeah? There was one scene in the Crouches where they went into a nightclub and the guy who was one of them, Robbie G, who I know him personally, he's a good brother. You know, to me, people do what they do. Maybe he has to feed his family. And the money. Yeah, yeah. But the point is they went into a club, a nightclub, a black club. This is what bothered me. And when they went in there, one of them, it wasn't Robbie G, it was the other one. He went, he went, can you smell that? And like Robbie G goes, what? And he goes, minge, the something, something. Do you know what minge is? Minge is pum pum. Okay. Punani, oh. vagina. And what I said, I remember I had to phone my bridge with my best friend Delwyn. I phoned him and I said to him, what the hell's that about? Listen, 
do you think as a black man, we're going to go into a club and say, oh yeah, wow, this is great. We can smell underneath women. <laughs> you tell me if that kind of, maybe white people do that. Well, you don't do that. Uh-huh. So what, 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 I mean, like now we, we like, like almost 20 years after, what happened to those actors? Are they still? <laughs> they're still doing stuff. You know, at the end of the day, what I'm saying is they're still doing stuff. And I am not one of these people who's going to condemn them. Because at mm -hmm. the end of the day, I'm not an actor. Sometimes yeah. we have to make choices to feed our families That's if we cool. want to pursue our careers. Yeah. And I think it's very, it's very rich when you get people who have already make it, who have already made it, come out and condemn people. I never heard them condemning people before yeah. when they were struggling. Yeah. yeah. So what I'm basically saying is, I am not going to hold that against brothers and sisters. I would more say. We need to ensure that organs like the BBC don't get away with it right. because we pay for them. I am, I will never look. You've used the word today, sellout. Sis used it with someone called Quasi. But here's my question to you When did he ever buy in? Because for me, to someone to be a sellout means it will be somebody like there's one that no, there's more examples. I'm not going to call any names. But there are some people who really, act, yeah, I'm down with the struggle, black brothers and sisters. And the first thing they get of celebrity, they're gone. They're sellouts because yeah. they bought in. They made us think they were with us. Right. And then they sold us down the river. If yeah. those people yeah. have always yeah. been like that, then they're not sellouts. They're just doing what they've always done. Because yeah. then... this, this this discussion, Professor Les, we had like, I, th I think it was uh, two weeks ago on National Dutch TV, right? So there is the, this guy who went to Suriname and actually uh, filmed or did some uh, uh, footage. I didn't watch the show, the whole show, because it was like, you know, a whole commotion, uh, commotion about it, about, about um, yeah, African spirituality in Suriname and the way he portrayed it. And, you know, you can imagine all the stereotypes yeah. uh, that have been used for 200 years and phased on national Dutch TV, uh, you know, we have those kind of decisions going on as well. Like how could people get in Suriname or people in Suriname get to a camera and try to act, you know, just the way you portrayed it, that show is the same way he portrayed it, uh, yeah. African spirituality in Suriname. So the struggle is real. The struggle is real. And to me, the way we counter it is by doing stuff like this. Right. That's how we counter it, because what we don't really understand is, yeah, you might not reach 7 million people, but you might reach the one person you need to reach to who can disseminate the information, right. which yeah. I think is different. Yeah. You know, it's why you, when I used to do music, I, I remember myself and my cousin, we took an album to about three major record companies. One of them was Jazzy B. Soul to Soul. We went and saw his a &R man, whatever it was. And the guy actually said, he said, this is a brilliant album. The concept is great lyrically, but guess what? They won't accept it here because it's too pro-black and it's too African centered. I don't chat slackness. I don't talk about killing African people. I don't talk about shooting babies off the breast. I don't talk about what I do with my woman or women, cause it ain't your damn business. What I do is I talk about what it is to be an African person in the world. Good, bad and indifferent. That's what I do. So the album was rejected. I remember one white record company that I was actually signed to at the time, um, Music of Life, and I had a good time with Simon and Chris who owned it. You know, I'll take nothing away from them, but when I went to them with a track that I wrote about my mother, they said it was too sentimental. And the reason why they say that is because African men are not supposed to be sentimental. Right. You're not supposed to express that, especially yeah. for your mother. Yeah. You know, when I was at school, I say this to people all the time, you know, I don't know what it's like in the Netherlands, but in England, maybe it's changed now, but when we were at school, if you wanted to insult a white boy, yeah, a white kid, white boy, if you wanted to insult him, let's say we're 13 or 14,
there are two guaranteed ways that you'd make him fight you. One, you call him a wanker, because for some reason, you know, I know we've got younger viewers here, but welcome to the real world, yeah? <laughs> but you can either do that, or you call him a mummy's boy. You got shut up, you're a mummy's boy. Bang, it was all off. <laughs> when they used to call me a mummy's boy, I used to say, thank you. Because <laughs> to me, it was the best I could be. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. I never understood why it never upset me. And I'm like, but I come from my mum. I love my mum. What better can you be than be a mummy's boy? But for them, it speaks to something else. Do you see what I mean? And sometimes I think as Africans, we have to just take a step back. You know, people of African ancestry, we take a step back and say, but we've always done this. Look when you go to ancient Kemet and look at the look at the images that you get that celebrate love. Look at other cultures across the continent and look at how love is celebrated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Point made. That's uh, that's what you call a difference in. Uh, oh, Don is gone. This is what you call a difference in. Um, um, say a difference. Um, cultural, a cultural difference. Yeah, absolutely. Like, absolutely. Yeah, we, we embrace our moms, and Europeans have yeah. European men have a problem with that. Um, we still have like uh, thirty minutes left. Actually, twenty because we have to close, of course. Um, what I want to ask still, and if uh, Sister Benji and Don Carleon don't have any other questions, I would like to ask you for the last part of three is, uh, are there any examples of organizations or individuals that have changed the system? Because we are saying whiteness, uh, racism is a system. We are talking empowerment now. So how do we change it for ourselves? How do we change for the family, for our friends? And are there examples? Well, to me, it's replete with examples. Mm -hmm. You know, were they appreciated in their historical moment, like Marcus Garvey? You know, um, if we look at Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, were they appreciated in their historical moments? Maybe not. But I think one of the things that we can absolutely do is work with people who we know are like-minded who we can freely disagree or agree with because remember we're dealing with we are dealing with interpretations of our situation based on the truth that we bring based on where we are in the struggle for human rights and human liberation first and foremost for us as africans because we're the most disaffected and disenfranchised people on the planet just because of how we look so for me, one of the things is to have open and honest conversations, but also get away from this idea that we need charismatic leaders or we need a leader. Get away from that, that whole Jesus savior complex where you can import some African-American buffoon who has no love for us whatsoever, other than the dollars, who will come over here I always say they come over here to the UK, I'm talking, they get us high, get us happy, and then they leave us alone. <laughs> what we need to do is we need to look at what we've got and we need to say, brother Don, this is your strength. Bro um, sister Benji, this is your strength. Sis I, this is your strength. What can you do around that? Even if it's in your own capacity, in your own community, because now we have a global stage like this mm -hmm. and people one of the for me one of the beautiful things that has come out of lockdown is people have realized there are alternatives because the day when as africans we realize it's not just me it's all of us as malcolm x said once you recognize the commonality of your condition you know you realize you will either work together or you won't where there is no vision people perish Right. But at the end of the day, the most important thing we can do is we can learn from the people who have done great works and we can support mm -hmm. the people who are doing the works at the moment. And sometimes it's really easy. Have a donation, tune into something like this, 
you know, oftentimes people will say things to me like, you know, well, you know, Dr. Les, Prof. Les, whatever, Brother Les, you know, why isn't anyone doing this, this, this? And I'll say, well, maybe that's your works. Right. And if you can't do it, you have the idea. Share the idea with people. Reach out mm -hmm. to people who can do it, especially the younger generation, the younger ones who are coming up, but the younger ones who are coming up that are of sound mind. Because just like, don't think that just because people are young and they got fire, they're sensible. Just like, don't think that people might be my age and they got fire, they're sensible. Because sometimes they're not. Right. And I'm sure it's in the Brader file, Anthony Brader says something like, the worst person you can follow is a fool. Because not only are they fooling themselves, they're fooling you as well. Yeah. So to me, the, the, it's, it's, it's quite simple. We just look for people who are dealing with specific things and we support them. The thing that grates me the most, and I'll be honest with you, you know, I don't have a lot of friends. I don't really reason with a lot of people unless I'm out. I don't have visitors because I like my own space. I've created enough of a family, so I don't really need much more. But the point that, that, just, sound, that just sounds like Sister A. <laughs> yeah, we're probably cut from the same cloth. But the point is, and the serious point is, you know, don't tell me, don't come to me and moan about this, this, and this. Unless you're going to do something. Because right. no one moans more than me. And I don't think probably I isn't even as miserable as I am. But <laughs> I'll do something Whoa. about it. I'll moan about it. Like, for instance, right now, Goldsmiths College, where I used to teach, have created a master's in Black British history. Whoa. Now, loads of Black British historians have applied for that position. They rejected them. And what they did was they imported an African-American woman. Ah. Okay? So she's heading it up. Then they wanted somebody to teach the bachelors. They've imported a white Canadian woman. Now, what is really bad about that, and this is why it really annoys me, because I was at Goldsmiths and they gave me a torrid time, which will all be revealed in my next book. Yeah. But this is what bothers me. One, it makes it look like no one who was born in the UK is competent enough, although they've got a PhD, is competent enough to teach a bloody course about Black British history. That's one signal it sends out. The worst aspect of it is last year, students occupied buildings at Goldsmiths College for over three months. There was no teaching. And they occupy the buildings because they said it needs to be decolonized, the curriculum, you're not representing the student body, you're right in the middle of Lewisham, which has one of the highest concentrations of black people in England, in that borough, and you don't represent them at Goldsmiths, and yet they can still slap you straight in the face. Well, to me, we should not let them get away with it anymore. Wow. Yeah. We should not let them. When I was at Goldsmiths, they wouldn't even shortlist me for the job I was doing. Three times I went for the job I was doing, they wouldn't shortlist me. Yeah. And that's why when I left, you know, I've said it loads of times. I took a grievance out against them on one, and they thought I was looking for money. And I actually said to them, I don't want to work here. You know, I'd set up my company, New Beyond Limited Learning by Choice, with my bridging and my wife. And I basically said to them, the only reason why I've taken you to this grievance is so that the next time someone who looks like me is in front of someone like you, you look at what's on the paper and not in their face. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, the reason why I am like this is because it makes me sick when I get all these so-called white experts on black culture or what, you know, who's the best reggae DJ in Jamaica in England? White man. <laughs> the, best, the best reggae selling group is a, white, is a white group. But don't get That's me wrong. Learn, I've right? worked with these yeah. people. And yeah, they are good. But the one thing that they really wish they were is black and they're not. So why do mm. we celebrate them so much? What? And that you know, you know, Professor to Les, you know, Professor Les, sometimes, you know, because sometimes we get, yeah, like, uh, I, I experience it a lot, like, on the internet, you have those 
endless discussions about you know when you 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 are spreading some kind of knowledge that you get into discussions with you know all the black people who actually having hard times to digest the information you're giving to them and they rather accept it easier from a white man or person yeah. than just getting it for a black man i have i need to put a, a whole list of uh, 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 where I took this information till, you know, at yes. least 70 yes. professors for them to digest it. Yes, absolutely. And that again is how whiteness works because what whiteness does is because it sets white as the standard, as the norm, mm -hmm. you just accept it. So if you've got a particular white voice coming at you that sounds really intelligent, people will accept it. But when we present the knowledge, they want to know where did it come from, who wrote it, who their mother was, who their grandmother was, who their blasted dog is, what's their cat's name. They want all this foolishness. And this is one of the things what I refuse to do. I refuse to prove myself as being clever to anyone. You want to know how clever I am, go and listen to some of my lyrics from Sound Systems or read my books or read what I've written. I'm not here to prove anything to white people. I don't care. Why should I have to? But what you have to do is prove to me what you reckon you know about me. You prove it. That's I'm not good. doing the proving. That's a we good. live it. So yeah. why do we have to prove it? So how how how, how 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 could I mean like now it's like 2020, right? We like an Aquarius age. So what kind of shield could we use to protect ourselves from this whitening, you know? Knowledge. Knowledge. Yeah. Knowledge is the shield. It's not only the shield, it's also the sword. Mm -hmm. The shield and the sword. Because as Garvey said, you know, remember he said, they said, the pen is mightier than the sword. Oh. But he said the word is mightier than them both. Mm. Something like that Garvey said. Marcus Messiah Garvey said that. Mm. They said the pen is mightier than the sword, but the word is more powerful than them both. And to me, you know, I'm not being flippant when I say knowledge, because you, again, you know, that beautiful universal reference. It's not, if you don't believe in coincidence, you know, we are absolutely in the age of Aquarius, pouring forth of knowledge. So whether you're into this, this the, whatever it is, astro astrological signs and whatever, there's yeah. a universal order there. There is no, so in my world, there's no such thing as coincidence. Just yeah. like <laughs> This is what Don says all the time. Exactly. That's why we're <laughs> laughing and we're making jokes about it. He said, yeah, because, no, yeah, everything. Because if you, if yeah. you look for patterns, look, so for instance, in England, they had this thing similar to what they have in America. I don't know if it's come to the Netherlands where they're pulling down statues of old slavers and whatever. Yeah. yeah? Mm. So then what happens is you get this white backlash, like this, this idiot historian David Starkey who basically said you know what happened to Africans wasn't genocide otherwise there wouldn't be so many damn blacks in Africa and here he said this a couple of months ago okay he's supposed to be a historian I've shared tv programs with him okay yeah. now what really makes me laugh about that is he in his whatever it was he was saying he basically said well you know we gave the Catholics emancipation the same time we gave the blacks emancipation you don't hear the catholics going on about it and it's because we resolved all of those things at that time so what he's basically saying is the proverbial chip is on our shoulder because there's nothing wrong now of course, but it's always it's always us i think there's a, a same kind of guy here in in the netherlands his name is uh, peter emmer he's supposed to be this uh, top yeah. ranking professor and and if you hear what's coming out of this guy's mouth He's just basically throwing up literally all the time because yeah. uh, he just, uh, and, and uh, I'm so happy that not too long ago, there was this amazing um, research that came out about, because the way, and, and you know, I'm going to school at the moment. I've been talking to I about this as well. There's this book uh, that's supposed to be for all teachers in the Netherlands, yeah. history. And what the way that they're portraying this is that they actually slavery was actually like their they had a hobby. They didn't make any money out of it. Yeah, you know, right. but 
Well, it was just like a hobby and, rubbish. you know, they Absolute only have like, yeah. it's like, you know, and uh, the other research, which is really good, is that uh, the, what the guy did is that uh, an opposite to what they've been doing all these years is that they're, they're focusing on some, on the richest families who made all this money. But what he did is that he started to look at, okay, there's this, is uh, sugar coming out of Suriname. Yeah. And what happens to it when it comes here? It's gonna go into uh, production. So you have all these people working on it. So they are making money. Now the, the people that are producing all the sugar here, because actually, in I didn't know that myself. In the 1750s, Amsterdam was the biggest sugar producing uh, city of northwest uh, northwest Europe. I didn't even oh, know that. Yeah. Doesn't so surprise what, ha me. what happened? What happened is that they're looking at it's like a chain, because yeah. the people that are working to to uh, refine the sugar, they need all kind of things, all kinds of utensils to make the sugar. So Absolutely. there are people working to make those utensils. They're getting paid. There are people that, that are uh, they using uh, furnaces. There, there are people that making that again. So that he's looking at the chains. He's not looking at okay. There's these families that making all the money. No, he's looking at the big reaction that's happening inside the Dutch society on the economic level. Absolutely. You see, really what is this? You see what you've just done there. Yeah, yeah this is what we need. We that is what we're not supposed to do. Yeah. <laughs> what you've just done there is exactly why I'm saying for me, sometimes these things aren't that difficult to overcome because what you've okay. just done there, yeah. like what this David Starkey said, um, he equated what happened to Africans with Catholics. Right. And I was reasoning with some people. I did a couple of talks last week, one, one US company and uh, in fact, I did about three talks last between Monday and Tuesday online, mm. whatever it is. And one of the things what I said to them is, I live in a 99% black world. My world is a black world. And it always has been by choice. Mm. I have one white friend who I grew up with. Right. You know, I have, I had my white auntie, peace be upon her, she passed late last year or early this year and i've got a white son-in-law my world is black and what i said to them is if i know a hundred catholics they're all black <laughs> now i don't know they're catholics unless they tell me but i do know they're black so how the yeah. hell can you confuse the two how can you confuse a racial identity with a religious identity with the religi what you're it gets more pernicious than that yeah yeah because just like when you're saying those aspects of the trade right. get lost. Right. So for instance, when I used to teach my students about the Industrial Revolution, right. more so when I was at Goldsmiths than I do now, I used to say to them, okay, where does the cotton come from? Where does it come from? Someone's picking that cotton, okay. you know, that you're using to, to make linen and all these wonderful fabrics. Right. Right. Where does it come from? Those are the st parts of the story that are they elided or excluded. Those are the aspects they don't yeah. want us to know. And this really comes down to this whole notion of yeah. decolonizing the curriculum. Yeah. Because how white scholars have framed it is, you want to destroy all white scholarship. You want to take black scholars off the curriculum. Yeah. Sorry, you want to take white scholars off the curriculum. Yeah. And I say to them, well, no, I don't want to do that. What I want to do is put some stuff up there that will create a balance or give the students exactly. an alternative. Exactly. Quick example, I was interviewed by one of the mainstream newspapers because I've done no interviews for the BBC or any of them during this lockdown, George <laughs> Floyd stuff. Mm -hmm. I just said, let the people who they usually get, get on with it. Because one, I ain't into no argument with no white people. Because the first thing I would say to them exactly. is this, I ain't here to educate you. You should be doing that yourself. It's not my job to educate you. My job is to reason with people who want to reason with me. Whatever they want to bring to the table is fine. But I'm not into no 
beer baiting or conversation. Look, I'd rather fight than argue. And I've been like that since I was a kid. <laughs> because to me, I don't want to argue with anyone, especially some, you know, what? you know, there's an African saying that says, never argue with a fool because passers-by won't know the difference. That's mm -hmm. why I won't go on those. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. That's why I won't go on them. I love yeah, that guess one. What? Yeah. The most important thing for me is, yeah, when they say about decolonizing the curriculum or taking down statues and stuff like that, I was in an interview with this guy from a mainstream newspaper, and I said to him, I grew up in a place, I grew up in Lewisham, South East London. I was born in Lewisham Hospital with my twin brother. And down the bottom of our road where we used to live in a place called Forest Hill was a massive park, and the park is called Honor Oak Park, honor of the oak in the park, yeah? Oh. In the park, there is a tree and it's called One Tree Hill. When we were at school, so we're getting this knowledge from where five, it was called Honor in the Oak Park because Queen Elizabeth I, the white queen, on her way through from wherever the hell she was going to, she stopped in the little hamlet, which whatever Lewisham was called at the time, and she rested under that tree. So we were taught about Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth I, the white queen, she was so great. She was so, she was a virgin and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but guess what? Yeah, right. <laughs> so I'm talking to this guy and I know he's thinking, what the hell's he on about? And I said to him, now, if you want to decolonize the curriculum, all you do is give the other side of Queen Elizabeth I. Right. One, why did they call her the White Queen? You've already mentioned sugar. Because of her sugar consumption, her skin was really pallid, apparently. Like, yeah. floppy, gorse, white. Yeah. She had no teeth. Well, no teeth, yeah. Which was all sugar. Many of the European elites at the time, because of sugar yeah. consumption, because of sugar. they usually yeah. never had no teeth. Her teeth were all yeah. black. They called her the mumbling queen because she used to have to stuff her mouth. You know, when you've got no teeth, your, your jar sucking. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> she had to stuff her mouth with paper and bits of cloth. And she used to mumble. So I said to this guy, that means we have never, in, to my knowledge, had an accurate description or depiction of Queen Elizabeth I on any of these films or any of these TV programs, real historical programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because um, they can't talk about her rotten teeth without mentioning sugar. And if they mention sugar, where does the sugar come from? Delivery. Oh, yeah. 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 That's how you decolonize. Yeah. That's how you decolonize. Thank you. You Thank you. We're the... running out of time. I have to break in. We still have 10 minutes left, of course. No way. Yes, we have 10 minutes. Yes, every way. It teaches yes, to way. We have early. Left. Yes, way. Um, I want to go and said it seven till oh. ten. Again? <laughs> you cheated and said, when you started, you should have said, oh, no, we're going to English time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 please. No, okay, we have five minutes left, even less. Can a journey is really, really, really um, um, into the conversation. It says, Dr. William Henry is really, really straight, um, straight, Allah, Allah, I, I like him. I like. Yeah. I like to follow another conversation from Dr. William Henry about religion, and that is a deep one. So oh, this, uh, I'll be honest, religion I won't do. Oh, I wouldn't mind mm -hmm. being on a panel, mm -hmm. but religion on its own I wouldn't do because I'm not you. To me, if you really want to discuss those aspects of religion, get Prof. Robert Beckford, or um, Dr. Gabrielle Beckles Raymond. Okay. I can give you the contacts, but get them. They will put the religious thing. Oh, thank you for that. I, I hope you hear that, uh, Kemet, uh journey. I hope you hear that. That's a really good one. Yeah, thank I you. can give you them because they would be, as I said, I'm not best place for doing do it that. because I've never studied theology, whereas I believe that they have. Okay, and thank me, you. For if that. you really want to understand yeah. it, Get someone who studied theology. 
Okay, right. and he also wants to order the book, so you know it can be ordered. Yeah, again, if you get enough, if you get some orders, and then I can send them over to you. I don't know how many I left you with, but um... okay, I have some left. And Eden, well, well done. Hi, Eden. That's a long time. She says, "Great to hear you teaching again, Doctor Ness." That's Eden, and Michelle Grant is saying, "Great to hear the lively debate, Doctor Ness." And there was somebody else who was greeting you. That's also Deborah Banel is also greeting. She said, Dr. Les! <laughs> and then hands up. So that's really good. It has come to an end. And um, I would like, because we only have three minutes left or five, and I want to ask you about uh, critical thinking and close with critical thinking. Yeah. Um, I think this is what we've been doing just two hours. This Absolutely. But for just for the record, could you say something about critical thinking and reasoning and then we're going to close? What Sister Benji just did for me is critical thinking par excellence. You oh. look at the thing in front yeah. of you and you think about how did this get here? How does sugar get here? How does tea get here? How does coffee get here? How do these things get here? And that for me is what, because you see what it is, a lot of academics, they like to use all this convoluted language and make things more complicated than they have to be. And the reason is, two, to me, there are two reasons. One, either they don't really understand what the hell it is they're doing, or <laughs> just like if you believe in God and you believe in the devil, they're there to confuse and confound you. Right. Or as Malcolm X said, to bamboozle you. Right. To me, critical thinking is what we do. But as I said, for Rasta, we just call it reasoning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And many people cannot hack it. They can't take it because if you ask them, look, I have had debates and discussions with serious white academics who are supposed to be up there. And at the end of the day, sometimes I'm, I'm listening to them and I'm thinking, either you take me for a complete fool or who are the <laughs> being i've ever met well but it's terrible okay. so it's, I it's really terrible because you now dr dr les like i was talking about this book they were actually trying to prove this is a book from 2016. Yeah. they're trying to prove in this book that pyramids were built by slaves are you serious yeah, i know it's, it's it, but again you, you see even things like that are so easily refuted, easily refuted. Because you can look at the history of any people who were slaves. Let's just think about slaves. Forget about African enslavement, because that's qualitatively different. That's a different right. conversation. But think about slaves. One of the things that have been proven, and I know there was um, some, some psychologists, I can't remember their names at the moment, but they did extensive work in apartheid South Africa. Right. And one of the things what they said was they realized that if you gave like the Africans under apartheid a painting job, they would only do rudimentary things. Okay. Paint fences, paint houses, paint gates. You could never get them to do an aesthetically pleasing work of art. Slaves can't do that. And they will not do it. And human beings won't do that. Of course not. As the enslaved. Okay. They will only do rudimentary medial stuff. Mm -hmm. And the things that fly in the face with all that, it's just like when they say, oh, you know, you watch the 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 um kings of Egypt or whatever it is, then Walt Disney. Oh, the Vikings of Egypt. <laughs> where they completely confuse histories and they've got uh, Moses and Ramesses in the chariot race and they bash off the nose of the of the Swing well, or something it, like that. Mm. Big foolishness. But what they're doing mm. is they're reinforcing that notion yeah. that it was Jewish or Hebrew slaves who built the pyramids. We when weren't Hebrews there. weren't there 6,000 years yeah. ago. They weren't. The pyramids were done, dusted, and forgotten 3,000 <laughs> years before. I say to people, if you want to really understand what that's like, it would be like, me and you, let's all of us, you come to England and I say, let's go to the local supermarket. And when we go into the local supermarket, we say, my God, there's Jesus over there. Let's see if he can turn this, this water into wine or what the hell. 
Oh it's over 2,000 years, three, yeah. four, five thousand years gap. Yeah, yeah. But what they do is they confuse us and they make us think that mm -hmm. this character could have existed then. It's yeah. like Moses. Why is Moses the only person in the Bible with half a name? Mm. You have Ra Moses, <laughs> Chuck mm. Moses. Why Moses? Moses means either son of or drawn from water. Yeah, I'm, not a, I'm not an expert on ancient african history but i'm not a fool mm -hmm. it would be mm -hmm. like me saying to you like if you said oh, your name and i go hen and hen what well hen <laughs> everyone else is called henry or hendry <laughs> but me name hen <laughs> <laughs> professor dr les and benji and don it's actually time we have to close thank oh, you very my much goodness for really really thank you thanks and sis i thank yeah. thanks to you all Thank i need a, i need a i need a reason to come back to the netherlands you need a reason to come back well <laughs> you will you will everybody's coming back of course well, let's let's actually, actually Pro professor Les, from rasta yeah. to rasta right me i'm sending you a tune because me want you to mc a part just i was thinking about posting some lyrics because i'm a musician myself i'd like to have you on one of the tracks just with those Listen, players, you send the you track know, and i'll cover bars. it Yes, yes. Track, I'll, I'll, cover it. I'll even come over there and voice it. I mean, this is that, what that's the I reason to coming it. back in Holland. Of course, <laughs> we're gonna do all of that. Thank well, I, I, do you know joining. the funny Thanks thing is joining. when I used to do talks in Gothenburg in Sweden around 2003, a white reggae band came to one of my talks, which I didn't know. And the next time I went to Gothenburg, they picked me up from the airport and I did a live show with them that evening. <laughs> <laughs> I just got, I literally got an email saying from a wonderful guy, Professor Uwe Cernhade, his name was, or something like that. And he said to me, oh, Les, you're going to be picked up from the airport by this white um, Swedish reggae band. They want you to perform with them. And I was like, why not? Here you go. So you know what you can do, Don. You know what? Yeah, absolutely. You absolutely. Done. That's at the least. Man. The it's England. It's not that far. Yes, so right. thank you very much. Enjoyed it a lot. Um, enjoyed it. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for participating. Thank you for giving us this knowledge. Uh, yeah. Reasoning. Well, as I said, I give thanks and give thanks. I'll just stay blessed and stay focused. Brassa. 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 Don't know the thing. We're not a thing. Yes, sir. Right. Yes, I thank you, thank you, thank you very much. See you next time. Uh, yeah. next one we're live again. Always love this again. Thank and you look keep up the keep the faith and keep up the good works and work good. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Yes, sir. Rastafari lives.